Hi, and welcome to Accounting 2120, Business Tax Accounting. Um, I'm your instructor, Mary Hankinson, and uh, we will begin in Learning Module 1, which is the world of taxation. In Learning Module 1, we'll be doing Chapters 1, 2, and 3. I will do a separate video for each chapter. In this video, we are doing Chapter 1, Introduction to Taxation. So um, in this chapter, it's really just an overview of everything, and we're just going to really lightly hit on the subject of um, pretty much what we're going to be learning this entire semester. Uh, we'll talk about the taxes in our lives, um, the structure of tax systems, types of taxes, um, income taxation of business entities, uh, tax planning fundamentals, and then just really understanding the federal tax law. So what is taxation? Um, a very famous quote by the uh, US Supreme Court, Court Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. says taxes are what we pay for civilized society. Um, this is a really just sums up the primary purpose of taxation, which is to raise revenue for government operations. Uh, governments at all levels, national, state, and local, require funds for defense, protection, such as your police and fire, um, education, transportation, the court system, social services, and so much more. Um, various types of taxes uh, provide the resources to pay for government services. Um, taxes can also be used to influence behavior of individuals. Um, so like examples would be like a tax credit if you buy a hybrid or electric vehicle. Um, so you'll get, so if you purchase one of those, you get a tax credit, meaning you have, you reduce the amount of taxes you have to pay. Um, but then other examples would be an excise tax, such as tobacco tax, um, where you pay more taxes for buying certain products. Um, and that's hoping to discourage um, consumers from buying those products. Um, so the relevance of taxation to accounting um, and finance professionals, what does that really mean? What does that mean? So federal um, corporate income tax rate is about 21%. Uh, state income taxes constitute an average of additional 5%. So a large corporation may devote about 25% of its net income to pay income taxes. In addition, businesses are subject to employment taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, and various excise taxes. Um, corporations with international operations are subject to taxation in other countries. Some small businesses also pay a variety of taxes that affect profits and cash flows. So given its significance, taxation is a crucial topic for accounting and finance professionals. And they have to understand these various types of business taxes um, to be able to assist effectively with things like compliance. Uh, what is compliance? That's ensuring that the business files all tax returns and makes all tax payments on time. Otherwise, they could um, result in paying a penalty. Um, tax professionals or accounting and finance professionals um, assist with planning. Um, it helps uh, business to apply favorable tax rules like deferring income and obtaining tax credits to minimize tax liability. Um, they also, um, accounting and finance professionals assist with financial reporting. Uh, financial statements include a variety of tax information, including income tax expense on the income statement and deferred tax assets and liabilities on the balance sheet. And then, of course, there's controversy. Um, they can assist when the taxpayer interacts with the tax agency, such as the IRS. Um, the IRS and the state local tax agencies regularly audit tax returns to verify the taxes were properly computed and paid. An accounting and finance professional um, could assist that company when dealing with the IRS. And of course, cash management, ah, that's, that kind of goes back with the whole compliance. Um, uh, you know, taxes have to be paid on time. If not, then you have to pay penalties and fees. Well, obviously um, that is going to affect your cash flow. Um, and then let's go lastly, data analysis, which uh, with the majority, if not all of a company's records maintained in digital form, uh, there's opportunities to use this information to enhance prop 
profits, um, better understand the customer base, and improve and understand the information from a tax perspective. Uh, tax practitioners often need skills in data analysis and visualization to identify samples for both internal and external audits, find ways to identify the products and services subject to sales tax in different states, and extracts tax data to help inform other business functions, such as where to locate a new sales office. Um, so the IRS and state tax agencies also use data analysis to help identify potential um, audit issues. Yeah, how to study taxation. All right, obviously the goal um, is to recognize issue, issues or recognize transactions uh, with tax implications and to try and understand the justification for the related tax rules. Um, you may have heard that uh, tax is difficult subject because of the many rules, exceptions and definitions. You may have even heard that it's boring. Um, but taxation is important and it can be exciting if you take what you're learning and see how you can apply it with what's going on in today's world, what's going on in um, the government, what's going on with your local government and even on the federal level. Um, and um, for tax professionals, the study of taxation is ongoing um, because the rules and the laws are forever changing. So there's always something new to learn. Um, and in studying taxation, you should always understand the rules wise. Don't just memorize the rules. Don't just memorize the laws, but why? What's behind them? What caused them? What um, generated their um, coming into to being? You know, usually a law is made because of a situation that occurred, uh, something that happened. Um, and those can be, you know, extremely interesting to learn about. And learning about the whys um, helps you better understand how the law is applied. Um, this is a little diagram uh, used to consider where in a circle a various rule fits. Um, so you have your tax compliant, your tax planning, and your tax controversy. Um, then on the inner circle, you have personal consumer, employee, investor, business. So is it a tax compliance issue? Is it a tax planning is the issue? Is it a tax convert controversy issue? Then does it affect a business, a personal consumer, an employee, or an investor? And then is it a personal responsibility, a civic responsibility, or a financial literacy? Um, and that is um, questions you would ask um, to, to figure out um, where uh, the rule fits. Um, for the individual. Now, the structure of the tax system. All right, so there are two components. You have the rate and you have the base. The rate is usually the percentage applied to the base. Um, and the base can be anything from um, income or sale price, et cetera. So we'll, um, but the tax liability is computed by multiplying the tax rate to the tax base. Um, tax vary by the structure of the rates and their base subject to the tax. So we'll talk about that more um, when we talk about the uh, three types of tax uh, taxes. You have progressive, proportional, and regressive, okay? Um, these are the different types of tax rates. <clears throat> Um, the tax rate that's progressive is if the rate increases as the tax base increases. Um, federal income tax is a great example of progressive tax. Um, so if your um, income is 15000 then your marginal tax rate may only be 10%. But if your um, base income increases to 200,000, then your marginal tax rate would in, could increase up to um, 24%. Uh, I believe federal income tax rates are anywhere between 10 and 37%. Um, but it's considered progressive because as the base, which is your annual income increases, your rate also increases. Now, tax is also a tax rate can also be considered proportional if the rate of tax is constant. So regardless of the size of the base and um, sales tax is a great 
example of that as well, um, because you pay 7% sales tax regardless of the cost of the item. So if you buy a car for $6,000, um, or if you buy a car for $20,000, either way, you're only going to pay 7%, um, sales tax. So if you buy it for, um, $6,000, then you're going to pay $420 in tax. But if you buy a car for $20,000, then you're going to pay $1,400 in sales tax. Now, the last one is called regressive tax rates. Um, this was a little trickier. Uh, regressive tax rates where, is where the rate decreases as the base increases. Um, federal unemployment taxes such as FICA and the um, Federal Unemployment Tax Act are, are regressive tax rates. Um, so Social Security and Medicare tax are examples of that. Um, so uh, I think in 2020 that if you made up to $137,700, um, you... Um, Yes. Uh, yes. Social Security, FICA, Social Security, as you know, FICA, and um, so so the Social Security, and Medicare tax. Um, if you if, let me look at my numbers. Yes, in 2020, um, if you made a, a maximum of one hundred and thirty-seven thousand seven hundred dollars, that's 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 the maximum. Then you paid um, average of seven point six five percent. Um, but if you make, uh, so, um, but if you make over 137,700, then, um, I believe you pay a, a lesser weight. Um, uh, we'll look those numbers up in just a second. Let me get that information. Yes, in 2020, the combined Social Security and Medicare tax rate levied on the wages of employees is 7.65% up to a maximum of $137,700 per annum and 1.45% on all wages over $137,700. So if you made... Um, um, $160,000, then you are going to be taxed 7.65% of 137,000 and then 1.5% um, um, on the remaining above that amount. And that is an example of regressive tax. Uh, most taxes are levied on one of four kinds of tax bases. Uh, you have transactions, which is your um, sales or purchases of goods, um, property or wealth, privileges and rights, and then income on a gross or net of expense basis. Um, so transactions are pretty obvious as your sales tax, your um, property and wealth. We have property tax. Um, and then um, privileges and rights. These include the ability to do businesses as a corporation, um, the right to work in a certain profession, and the ability to move goods between countries. So incidents of uh, taxations. We um, often think of our tax burden as including only the taxes we pay directly, um, but we also uh, pay many taxes indirectly. So the incidence of various taxes directly paid by businesses is on the final consumer of goods and services. Individuals also bear the incidence of the corporate income tax in their capacities as employees and investors and owners. So the um, incidence of property taxes um, on an apartment is primarily on the tenant rather than the owner. Um, since the owner factors this tax into their rental rate. So that's kind of like an indirect um, example of it. Um, so basically you are paying the property tax, um, but you're paying it to the owner through your rent. Um, so that's an indirect uh, way of paying um, taxes. Um, so <sighs> types of taxes. 
lots of types of taxes. Um, you have taxes on, um, you have sales tax, employment tax, taxes at death, gift tax, property taxes, um, and then um, other US taxes, and of course the big income taxes. So we're gonna really briefly just kind of talk about all of these. So the uh, taxes of the production uh, and the sale of goods. All right, so they are um, different types of taxes that are fall under this category. Um, you have the federal excise tax and the state excise tax, local excise tax, general sales tax, use taxes, value added tax, or for um, all of those fall under taxations of the production and sale of goods. So if we look at that one, that one is number one on our list, taxation on the production and sale of goods. So let's talk about the federal excise tax real quickly. Um, all levels of government impose excise taxes while state and local governments um, make heavy use of general sales taxes. So um, Little quick uh, history lesson, real quickly. Together uh, with customs duties, excise taxes served as the principal source of revenue for the United States during the first 150 years of our existence. Um, since World War II, though, the role of excise taxes in financing the federal government has declined, uh, falling from um, 30 to 40 percent of revenues to about 3 percent now. So prior to World War II, um, 30 to 40% of the federal government revenue came from excise taxes. Um, today, it's only about 3%. Um, the federal government has come to rely heavily on income and employment taxes as its principal source of uh, revenue. But despite the decrease in contribution of excise taxes, uh, the federal government um, continue to have significant impact on specific industries, such uh, currently trucks, trailers, tires, liquor, tobacco, firearms, um, sporting equipment, medical devices, and air travel are all subject to federal excise taxes. All right, so state excise taxes. Um, many states levy excise taxes are the same atoms that are taxed by the federal government. Um, most states, uh, such as gasoline, liquor, and tobacco, are example, um, and they differ from state to state. So an example of that is in New York, you may pay $4.35 tax on a pack of cigarettes, whereas in Missouri, you only pay 17 cents on a pack of cigarettes. Uh, some other examples of services subject to state and local excise taxes are like admissions to amusement uh, facilities, hotel occupancy, uh, rental uh, facilities, sale of playing cards, which is weird to me, but okay. Um, anyways, um, the hotel tax one is actually quite interesting. Um, the state of Georgia recently, well, not recently, it's been a couple of years now, uh, put in a hotel occupancy tax. Um, I think it's a, it's just a, a flat rate. It's just a, it's five dollars a night. Period, five dollars a night you have to pay. Um, and then I've noticed also when doing travel um, reimbursement reports for various employees that certain cities also will charge with. Um, as part of the hotel tax, a historical fee, which is never more than one or $2. Um, but um, on top of paying the hotel occupancy fee, uh, you also pay a historical fee. Um, so those could add up to almost $10 um, in just um, uh, taxes. <clears throat> Um, and uh, local excise tax, uh, again, talking about that historical tax, um, is added as part of the hotel occupancy tax. Um, so um, your local excise taxes would be enforced by your cities or your counties. Um, 
um, that would be what's considered local versus state. Um, so a few cities have created excise taxes that apply to digital transactions, like fees for streaming music and movies, app downloads, Uber, Lyft fares, and Airbnb rentals as well. <clears throat> now let's talk about general sales tax. Um, so again, this is usually under the jurisdiction of states and localities. And of course, states and localities means states and maybe your counties and your cities. Um, states that impose a sales tax also charge a use tax. We'll talk about that in a little bit um, and more in depth. Um, but there are, I think, five states that do not charge a sales tax. So that's Alaska, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon. Um, the U.S. federal government does not levy a sales tax. Again, this is only in the jurisdiction of states and your local uh, areas, such as your counties and your cities. Now, we're all familiar with sales taxes. I'm not going to go into detail what sales tax is. Um, uh, but I will say that um, in addition to some, like, you know, you have the five states that don't even do sales tax. Some states also do special provisions to where um, food's a great example to, um, if you go to a store like Walmart where you can buy a variety of items, um, if that uh, state and or county slash city um, maybe does a tax break on the purchase of food, they could do it one of two ways. They could either not include uh, the cost of the food and the base that is taxed, or they could um, do a lower tax rate on food items. Uh, now, use tax. Use tax is a transaction tax imposed at the same time, uh, same rate as sales tax. And what is the purpose of use tax really quickly? Um, so this kind of came about because obviously a way you can avoid paying the sales taxes, maybe try and do business in some states that either have a lower sales tax rate or don't charge sales tax at all. Um, or you could also um, then purchase um, uh, items from an out-of-state internet-based vendor, um, such as Amazon, that ships the goods directly to your house um, and avoid paying state sales tax. Um, so a use tax, um, is a tax is designed to uh, complement the sales tax. The use tax has two purposes. It prevents consumers from evading sales tax by purchasing goods outside the state or for in-state use and uh, to provide an equitable taxing environment between in-state and out-of-state retailers. So purchases of taxable goods or services who were not charged sales tax because the seller did not have a um, nexus with the purchaser state may owe use tax on the purchase. Um, now, uh, value added tax, which is also um, nicknamed VAT. Uh, this is not currently being used in the U.S. This is not, um, uh, has not been incorporated as part of the U.S. federal tax structure yet, but we'll go over it really quickly. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's a national sales tax that taxes the increment and in value as goods move through the production process. Um, the value added tax is um, used in the majority of countries, but again, it's not um, part of the US tax structure yet. Um, it is a variation of a sales tax that is levied at each stage of production um, on the value added by the producer. And a VAT is used almost by almost all countries in the world and um, serves as a major source of revenue for governments that do use it. Now, the next type of tax. So we have the employment taxes. And, um, so uh, both federal and state government tax the salaries and wages paid to employees. Um, FICA um, is, uh, we all know what FICA is. Uh, it stands for the Federal Insurance Contribution Act, but it's also commonly called the Social Security Tax. Um, so um, it is comprised of uh, the social security tax and the Medicare tax. Um, the employer is responsible for withholding from the employee's wages, the social security tax, and um, the um, and paying it on behalf of the employee. Um, so 
FICA has to has two components. Uh, again, it's got the, uh, with the, what they call the old age survivors and disability insurance portion, as well as the Medicare health insurance payments. Um, I won't go into detail of what the rates are that you pay of each, uh, but I will say that children under the age of 18 who are employed in their parents' trade or business are exempt from having to pay into FICA. That's an interesting little uh, tidbit about FICA. So um, again, I'm not gonna go into details about the, the rates that you pay um, into it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but we did kind of discuss this. We were talking about regressive tax. Um, again, um, I think Social Security, Um, is 6.2 and Medicare is 1.45 and add those together and they equal the average 7.65 rate. Um, but here it separates out which each one of this is there's two components to FICA, 6.2 for social security and 1.45 for Medicare. And um, um, so that equals a 7.65%. Now you're only uh, going to pay 7.65% up to 137,700. So if you make less than 137,700 a year, then you're gonna pay 7.65% of your annual income. But if you make more than 137,700 a year, then you're gonna pay uh, 7.65% on the 137 7, and then you're only going to pay 1.45% on anything over the 137 7. Um, now, an, an additional 0.9% tax um, earned on earned income above 200,000. So, what this is saying is for um, Medicare purposes. Um, an additional 0.9% Medicare tax will be imposed on earned income uh, if you're single, uh, 200,000, and if you're married filing jointly, it's 250,000. So unlike the Social Security tax of 6.2%, the regular Medicare portion of 1.5%, an employer does not match the employee's 0.9% additional. So the um, you do pay the additional, the employee pays the additional. Um, the employer does not have to match this additional. And I believe um, there's also an additional 3.8% Medicare tax assessed on any investment income of just over 200,000 for single or over 250,000 for married filing jointly. And that is for any investment income. Now we'll talk about self-employment tax. Uh, you have, uh, if you're self-employed, uh, self-employment individuals have to pay the FICA system in the form of a self-employment tax or SE tax. Um, you're required to pay both the employer and the employee portion. So you 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 have to you don't pay just yourself. I mean you you pay as your you pay out of your business as the employer and you pay um, out of your salary as the employee. Um, in 2020, the uh, self-employment tax rate was, I think, 15.3% yeah, on self-employment income up to the 137.7. And then additional 2.9% on any additional income above that 137.7 amount. Um, and then, but self-employed individuals can deduct uh, half of the self-employment tax. They can deduct the amount uh, the amount normally deductible is uh, by an employer. So the employer portion they paid out, they can actually deduct that as a business expense. Um, unemployment taxes. Um, uh, so um, this is another employment tax. Um, in 2020, I think, yeah, in 2020, the rate for employment tax was 6% on the first $7,000 for wages for each employee. Um, as with FICA, this represents a regressive rate structure. So the federal government allows a credit for unemployment tax paid um, to the state. So the credit 
cannot exceed 5.4% of covered wages. So as a result, the amount required to be paid to the US Treasury could be as low as 0.6% of an employee's wages. All right, so continuing with types of taxes, we've talked about sales taxes, excise taxes, We've talked about employment taxes. Now we're talking about taxes at death. And yes, you see my shocked face. Um, yes, there are still taxes even at death. Um, this is your estate tax and your inheritance tax. Um, so an estate tax is um, tax imposed on the right to transfer property by death. Thus an estate tax is levied on the descendant's estate and not on the heir receiving the property. If the law taxes the recipient of the property, it is then termed as an inheritance tax, which is a tax imposed on the right to receive property from a descendant. Thus, theoretically, an inheritance tax is imposed on the heir. Uh, the federal estate tax is imposed on the estate. So <clears throat> the value of the property transferred provides the base for determining the amount of the death tax. Um, so determining how it's taxed, the, the rate is going to vary based on federal and state levels. Um, but the base, how do we determine the base? Well, the base is determined based on the fair market value of the property. Now, the federal government only imposes a state tax. The federal government does not impose inheritance tax. Um, many states, the, but it's usually at the state level, and many states do impose an inheritance tax. And there are states that impose inheritance and an estate tax, so you can, um, pay at the federal level and the state level for both. Now, um, the federal estate tax was intended to prevent large concentrations of wealth from being kept within a family for many generations. Um, determination of estate tax begins with the gross estate, which includes property the descendant owned at the time of death, and also includes property interests, such as life insurance proceeds paid to the estate or a to a beneficiary other than the estate if the deceased insured had any ownership rights to the policy. Um, most property included in the gross estate is valued at fair market value, as I stated earlier, at the date of the death. Um, Deductions from the gross estate in um, arriving at the taxable estate include funeral and administrative expenses, certain taxes, uh, debts of the descendant, and transfers to like charitable organizations. Um, a marital deduction is available for amounts passing to a surviving spouse, such as a widow or widower. Now, state taxes on transfers at death may be estate tax, an inheritance tax, or both. So an inheritance tax is on the right to receive property from a descendant, and tax is generally based on relationship of the heir to the descendant. And in some cases, the more closely related the, de the deceased, the lower the tax rates imposed, and or the greater the exemption allowed. Um, and some states even allow a zero rate of tax on amounts passing to a surviving spouse. All right, next type of tax, gift tax. All right, and this is usually not um, in regards to a death. This is gift during the life, during you know the life of the person of the giver. So, um, so in other words, instead of waiting for you them to die for you to inherit something, they may decide to um, go ahead and give it to you in the form of a gift. Um, so then you have a gift tax. So tax on the right to transfer assets during the person's lifetime. So a taxable gift, um, let's see here, uh, uh, 
gift tax, uh, again, is um, a tax imposed on the transfer of property gift and is um, imposed upon the donor of a gift and is based on the fair market value of the property at the date of the gift. So taxable gift is the fair market value gift less annual exclusion, less marital deduction if applicable. So that's basically how you would determine the taxable uh, rate of the gift is you would take the fair market value of the gift less any annual exclusion and less any marital deduction if applicable. Uh, federal gift tax provides an annual exclusion of um, 15,000 per donee. So in other words, you can give up to $15,000 um, and, um, and that would be your, that's, that's like the max amount you can get to be excluded for a, a gift tax. Um, now married couples can make a special election to split gifts. Um, and this will enable them to transfer twice the annual exclusion per uh, donee per year. Um, so in other words, whereas um, here it was 15,000 um, and with a married couple, they can give up to uh, 30,000. Uh, now taxable gifts are reduced by deductions for gifts to charity and as well as to one spouse. And then gifts for medical and educational purposes may also be exempt from gift tax as well. All right, so now let's talk about property taxes. This is a big one too. <sighs> property tax um, is a tax on the ownership of property or a tax on wealth depending on the base used. So any measurable characteristic of the property being taxed can be used as a base, such as weight, size, number, or value. Um, now, most property taxes in the U.S. are taxes on wealth, and they use value as the base. Um, and these uh, value-added property taxes are known as ad valorem taxes. Here's a word right here, ad valorem taxes, if you can see my. Um, now, um, uh, ad valorem taxes are imposed on personal property as well. And the most common ad valorem tax is imposed by states, counties, and cities on real estate. So taxes on realty. Property taxes on real property or realty are used exclusively by states in their local political subdivisions, such as cities, counties, and school districts. Uh, realty generally includes real estate and any capital improvements that are classified as fixtures. Now, a fixture is something that's permanently attached to the real estate and its removal will cause irreparable damage. So like the best example is a built-in bookshelf versus a movable bookshelf. So a built-in bookshelf is considered a fixture, whereas a removable bookshelf is not. Um, that's the best example. Now, some of the characteristics of ad valorem on realty are uh, states may have homestead exemption, uh, lower taxes may apply to a residence owned by a taxpayer um, at the age of 65 or older. Um, some uh, jurisdictions extend immunity uh, from tax for a specific period of time, such as a tax holiday uh, to new or relocated businesses. Um, and then some states provide for lower valuations of property dedicated to like agricultural use. So in other words, farms or other special uses such as a wildlife sanctuary. Now taxes on person out, person out, person, personality, personality. That's not an easy word to say. Um, personality includes all assets that are not realty. Realty and personality are, can be either business use or personal use property. So some, here's some examples. Examples include a residence personal use realty, an office business, business use realty. All right, now let's go over here. Surgical instruments would be a business use personality. A family car would be a personal use personality. So there's your like examples of what is realty and what is personality. Now, 
uh, personal tea can also be classified as a tangible property or intangible property. So we can take that even further. So those examples were both tangible properties. So an example of an intangible property includes stocks, bonds, and um, other securities such as bank shares. Um, the following uh, generalizations may be made concerning the property taxes on personal tea. So generally for individuals, vehicles such as cars and boats are the only non-realty personal use assets subject to property tax. So generally, businesses are assessed property taxes on equipment and other tangible property, although many states do not tax inventory. And then some jurisdictions impose an ad valorem property tax on intangibles like stocks and bonds. All right, what are other US taxes? Um, these are things such as your customs and duties, which would be like tariffs on imported goods. Um, you have a franchise tax in some states, and which is levied on the right to do business in states. Um, and occupational taxes, um, which are applicable to various business trades. So you have to have like a liquor, liquor license, or a taxi cab permit, um, a fee to practice a profession. Um, an example of that is um, cosmetology. A lot of cosmetologists actually have to have a beauty license to um, work in certain, um, to be a certified beautician and, and to have to annually renew their certification and pay a fee. Um, and then of course there's a severance tax. What is that? Well, as tax all natural resources extracted, um, important revenue sources for states which are rich in natural um, resources. So if you ex want to extract natural resources from land, you may have to pay a severance tax. Now we'll talk about the biggie, income tax. Um, this is imposed at the federal, um, state, and local levels of the government. Um, income taxes are um, imposed on individuals, corporations, and certain fiduciaries, such as estates and trusts. Um, most jurisdictions attempt to assure tax collection by requiring you to pay as you go procedures. Um, now, as a, an accountant, um, one of your jobs could be um, working in the payroll department, where you will specialize in um, uh, withholding requirements for employees um, and estimated tax prepayments for the taxpayers themselves. So um, part of the function sometimes of a payroll uh, specialist or payroll technician would be they or were responsible for making sure the proper amount is withheld from each employee's paycheck uh, for income taxes and paid to the proper government, whether it's to the IRS for the federal or to the local government, such as uh, Department Georgia Department of Revenue. Um, now, the pay-as-you-go procedure means that every single paycheck, um, money is withheld and paid directly to the IRS or to the state local government, such as the Georgia Department of Revenue. Um, that is the and so it's withheld from your paycheck and then paid at the you know within a certain time frame. Um, to those two government entities. And that is what it means by pay as you go. Um, the income tax is based on the doctrine known as legislative grace. Um, all income is subject to tax and no deductions are allowed unless specifically provided for in the law. And some types of, um, some types of income are excluded on the basis of various economic, social equity and political considerations. Um, and again, individual rates range from 10 to 37%. And again, um, income tax is a progressive tax. So as the base increases, so does your rate. So the minimum rate is 10% and the maximum rate is about 37%. And what rate you're charged is based on your base, which is your annual income. Um, here's just a quick example of um, federal income tax formula for individuals. So if you start here, you start with your income, which is your most broadly defined income, and then uh, you can deduct any exclusions you may have, um, and that becomes your gross income, um, less any certain businesses and investment deductions, um, that becomes your adjusted gross income, and then you can decrease um, 
certain um, other personal deductions, um, any deductions for qualified business income, and then that becomes your taxable income. Um, and then once you have your taxable income, then you would apply any tax credits you may have. And once you've applied all your tax credits, so you start out with your income and you list all your deductions. So you start out with your income, less all your deductions, that becomes your adjusted gross income. Um, and then um, any further deductions uh, for qualified business income or um, the grader of certain personal and employee deductions, et cetera, that becomes your taxable income. So once all of your deductions are done, then that becomes your taxable income. And then from your taxable income, you will reduce it by any tax credits you may qualify for. And once all your tax credits are applied, then that is the amount uh, of tax owed or your refund. So, and what, what qualifies as a refund is if over the period of time, the pay as you go, process, you paid in more taxes um, than you needed to, then you get a refund. Um, if you paid, if you did not pay enough taxes as you did the pay as you go, and after all your deductions and credits, it shows that you still owe, then you have to pay more taxes. Um, usually if you did your um, w-4 correctly and you filled in all your deductions uh, correctly on your w-4 then when you got your w-2 and um, um, did your tax return most likely you got a tax refund so individual tax income for individuals deductions are separated into two categories you have deductions for your adjusted gross income and then deductions from the adjusted gross income so if you look here we had that we had your adjusted, your adjustments to your income and then adjustments to your adjusted gross income. So deductions from your um, adjusted gross income, what are those? Often personal in nature, example, medical expenses, mortgage interest, property taxes on a personal residence, any charitable contributions, and then um, any personal casualty losses you may have had. Uh, generally itemized deductions. Uh, individuals may take a standard deduction um, and a specified amount based on filing status rather than itemizing actual deductions. Now, state income tax. Um, all of the following states impose an income tax on individuals. You have Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, and Wyoming. Um, New Hampshire and Tennessee impose an individual income tax only on interest and dividends. Um, most states um, also impose either a corporate income tax or a franchise tax, tax based on in part of um, corporate income. Now, um, some additional points of state income taxes are state income tax usually rely on federal income tax laws to some degree. Um, most states withholding of state income tax from salaries and wages um, and estimated tax payments by corporations and self-employed individuals. Most states have their own set of rates, exemptions and credits. Um, many states allow a credit for taxes paid to other states, and virtually all income tax returns provide checkoff boxes for donations to uh, various causes. Now, local income tax. These are cities imposing an income tax, which include uh, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Detroit, Kansas City, New York, Philadelphia, and St. Louis, among others. Um, city income taxes usually apply to anyone who earns um, income in a city, including those who live in a suburb but work in the city. Now, <sighs> business entities and the income taxation of business entities. Huh, I know, scratching the head. So now we've just got to finish talking about the different types of taxes and the importance of understanding the different types of taxes and how they apply to the individual or, and or the business. Now we're going to talk specifically about types of business entities and um, how um, income tax affects these business entities. So again, we talked mostly about the individual. So now we're going to talk more in depth about businesses and um, how it affects them. So as you can see here, there are several different types of businesses. You have proprietorships, C corporations, partnerships, S corporations, limited liabilities, um, and limited liability partnerships. You have companies and partnerships. 
So a proprietorship is a, not a separate taxable entity, okay? Proprietor reports the debt profit of the business on his or her own individual income tax return. So income and deductions of the proprietorship are reported on a, a, a Schedule C, which is the profit or loss uh, from the business. And the net profit or the net loss of the proprietorship is then reported on the owner's form 1040, which is the um, US individual income tax return form. C corporations, um, they are a separate taxable entity, um, reports income, um, and expenses on a, on the form 1120, um, income taxed at corporate level, and again at shareholder level when distributed as a dividend. So income is taxed at the corporate level, and then it's taxed again at the shareholder level when distributed as a dividend. Um, partnerships, not a separate entity, much like a proprietorship, uh, files uh, information return on the the form uh, 1065 allocates partnership income to partners and partners report partnership income on their personal tax returns. C corporations are very much like that. I mean, excuse me, S corporations are very much like a C corporation for all non-tax purposes. Uh, shareholders have limited liability, shares are freely transferable, has centralized management, such as a vested board of directors, um, has unlimited continuity of life. That is, the corporation continues um, to exist after the withdrawal or death of a shareholder. Um, tax treatment of an S corporation, though, is more like a partnership. The S corporation is not subject to federal income tax. Um, like a partnership, it does file a tax return, but shareholders report their share of net income or loss and other special items on their own personal tax forms. So now let's talk about limited liability companies and limited liability partnerships. Uh, both forms have limited liability and some, but not all of the other non-tax features of corporations. Um, both forms usually are treated as partnerships for tax purposes. Uh, the S corporation, limited liability co company and partnership forms forms of an organization which are referred to as flow-through entities avoid the double taxation problem uh, associated with the C corporation. All right, so dealings between the individuals and their, their business entities. Okay, so many tax provisions deal with the relationship between owners and their business entities, including the following interactions. Um, owners put assets into um, a business when they create a business entity. Owners take assets out of the business during the existence of of the business in the form of like a salary, dividend, withdrawals, redemptions of stock, et cetera. Uh, through their entities, owner slash employees set up retirement plans for themselves, including IRAs, qualified retirement and pension plans. Um, owners dispose of or part of a business entity. Transactions between owner and business entities have important tax ramifications. So the following are a few of the many tax issues that arise. All right, so we talked about um, the following types of interactions. These are types of interactions between um, individuals and their business, okay? So many of these transactions between the owner and the business have important tax ramifications. The following are a few of these tax issues that could arise. Um, how the tax laws applies at both owner and entity levels and what effect what effective tax rate is assessed on such income, how to move assets into the business with the least adverse tax consequences, um, how to pull assets and accumulated profits out of the business with the least adverse tax consequences, and how to dispose of the business entity with the least adverse tax consequences, and whether certain tax rules will apply less favorably because the business and the owners are related parties. All of this um, is where the accountant and finance, finance professional really comes into play. Most business owners don't have time to look all this up. They don't have time to have all this stuff and be knowledgeable. So what do they do? They hire you, the accountant, the finance professional, because this is your specialty. This is what you do. And this is what you know. So being a tax professional, an accountant or a finance professional, this is what you'll know. And this is what you'll be hired to do. Um, and you will be advising the owner on this information. 
um, another important part uh, is tax planning. And again, most business owners don't have time to research all this. So what are they going to do? They're going to hire you, the accountant, the accounting finance tax professional. Um, and you're going to help them in planning strategies. And these strategies are going to help them avoid income recognition, um, which would be like compensating employees with non-taxable fringe benefits. You're going to help them in postponing recognition of income to achieve tax deferral, which would be like postponing the sale of assets, maximizing deductible uh, amounts, such as invest in stock or of another corporation, accelerating recognition of deductions to achieve tax deferral, elect to deduct charitable contribution in, in year of pledge rather than in year of payment, shifting net income from high bracket years to low bracket years. So you could postpone recognition of income in a low bracket year or postpone recognition of deductions in a high bracket year to, you know, postpone it to a high bracket year, excuse me. Shifting net income from high bracket taxpayers to low bracket taxpayers. Um, you could pay children to work in the family business. Um, shifting net income from high tax jurisdictions to low tax jurisdictions. Uh, you could um, establish a subsidiary operation in countries that have low tax rates. Again, most business owners are too busy running their business. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna hire you, the accountant, the finance tax professional. Um, so here's just more examples of planning. We won't go into detail, but you can control the character of income and deduction, deductions. You can avoid double taxation um, and you can help to maximize tax credits. So understanding the federal tax law. The federal tax law is the vehicle for accomplishing many objectives of the nation, such as raising revenue, um, which is the, the major objective of the tax system, um, but not the sole objective. Um, economic considerations. Uh, increasing important objective is to regulate the economy and encourage certain activities and businesses considered desirable. Um, a great example of that was um, a while back, um, I believe the uh, governor before Kemp, um, Governor Deal, I think was his name, um, actually wanted to bring more of the film industry into the state of Georgia. So um, he gave tax breaks to the film industry um, where they didn't have to pay um, as much sales tax uh, or state tax, excuse me, not sales tax, state tax for um like occupancy tax or franchise tax or anything like that, if they're part of the film industry coming into the state of Georgia, they got a tax break. So what did that do? That attracted a lot of the industry out of California into Atlanta because they could actually um, do film production at um, a cheaper cost because they didn't have to pay as much um, in taxes as they did in the state of California. So that is like an economic consideration, um, which moved, which in go, for Governor Deal, what he did was he created more jobs. He brought a new industry into the state of Georgia, which then created more jobs. Um, other objectives to um, tax federal taxes is social considerations. We kind of talked about this earlier, which is to encourage social desirable behavior that provides benefits that government might otherwise um, provide. Um, an example is a tax credit for purchasing a hybrid or electric car. And that's considered a social consideration. Um, equity consider considerations, equity within the tax laws, examples, wherewithal to pay concept and not necessarily equity across taxpayers. Um, this is kind of an unusual one, equity consideration. Um, Um, look up a really good example to help understand what is considered an equitable, equitable consideration. Um, let's look at an example of uh, uh, 
the uh, example that it talks about here, the wherewithal to pay concept, okay? So um, this concept recognizes the in inequity of taxing a transaction when the taxpayer lacks the means with which to pay the tax. So under it, there is a correlation between the imposition of the tax and the ability to pay the tax. Um, it is particularly suited to situations in which the taxpayer's economic position has not changed significantly as a result of the transaction. So let me give you an example of that. Um, Ron, who's a rancher, owns pasture land that is condemned by the state. And it was condemned by the state to be used as a game reserve. So in other words, the state said, I'm taking this land and we're going to use it as a game reserve. Um, now, the condemned pasture land um, initially cost Ron $120,000. He purchased that land for $120,000. Now, the state has come in and condemned it and says, we want to use it as a game reserve. So what are they going to do? They're going to pay him $150,000 for the land, which is at the time the fair market value of the land. So then shortly thereafter, Ron buys more pasture land at a cost of $150,000. So he took the $150,000 and bought more pasture land. Now, Ron has realized, has a realized gain of $30,000, which is $150,000 that he was paid less the $120,000 that he used to purchase the land. Um, it would be inequitable to require Ron to pay a tax on his gain. Um, without selling the new land, Ron would find it difficult to pay the tax. And Ron used the uh, proceeds uh, to purchase the land. So that's an example of equity consideration. Um, now, we do have um, federal, um, some more federal tax objectives, of course, is political considerations. A large segment of the tax law is created through the political process. And this is where it could be interesting where you can really kind of look at it and just kind of like, what's going on in today's world and um, when it comes to the federal tax laws. Um, so, uh, like I said, a large segment of the tax law is created through a political process. Thus, compromises and special interest dealings occur. We've all watched the shows that are like you know the political shows where they do all the wheeling and dealing y'all like scratch your back if you scratch my back because I really want this law to pass so if you support me in passing this law I'll support you in passing that law blah 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 so a lot of tax laws are passed uh for political considerations um and then of course you have the influence of the IRS many provisions are meant to aid the IRS in the collection of taxes so a lot of tax laws can be written to um, aid the IRS to be able to collect um, collect the taxes and then you have the influence of the courts so influence tax law and sometimes cause it to change so how does that happen how does the courts influence tax law well obviously um we talked about a lot of laws are written or changed because of things that happen in the real world. So, you know, legislative can sit up there and make all these laws and these rules. And then all these laws and the rules get applied and they realize, oh, there's a flaw. Uh, we've got all these businesses that are being affected by this new law that we didn't want to be affected because we didn't realize the chain effect, the domino effect that was going to happen. So then these companies go to court to try and, um, you know, basically say, oh, you know, this law isn't fair, this law isn't right, and they appeal it in the, in the, in the court system, which um, then the court system then can rule, you're right, these laws are not fair, and it goes all the way back up to legislation to change and rewrite the laws. All right, so um, that is the end of uh, chapter one. We will be doing uh, chapter two and chapter three in learning module one. Um, so if you have any questions, any concerns, um, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me or you can um, uh, ask questions in class. Um, uh, any um, emails sent to me, I um, usually answer within 24 hours. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to a a uh, fun semester where we are going to learn um, lots of interesting facts about tax law and hopefully um, be able to 
apply it to what's going on in the world today. Because again, the best way to make this interesting and not boring is to understand the whys and to see how it applies in today's world. So um, until next chapter. <laughs>